Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. When we got married, um, probably even before, I had mentioned to Jay that I was interested in adoption at some point. And he had said that he just really didn't feel like God had ever put that on his heart. And so um, it wasn't like a deal breaker for me or anything like that. It was just kind of like, in the future, this is something I'd be interested in. And then um, we got pregnant with Corbin and I was about eight months pregnant when he said, hey, I, I think God is calling us to do adoption one day. And I was like, well, I'm busy <laughs> with this one, so. We began to see that there was just such a great need for families in foster care. That was really kind of the, the tipping point for me. I really felt like it was a way for us to minister to those families, uh, to those fo foster kids that were coming into our home, leaving out of our home, just trying to be that dad for them during that period of time that they needed one. And all we'd ever really heard about foster care was what most people have heard about, you know, in the news or law and order, you know, pretty much yeah. the, the terrible stories. And none of those things are true. And also, we also thought that it would probably be pretty expensive to try to, you know, bring kids in or even adopt from foster care. And finding out that not only is it not expensive, but that the state reimburses you and your adoption fees are covered. We just realized all the potential roadblocks, I guess, that we had thrown out there, you know, kind of to the Lord, like, well, what about this? What about that? Foster care just kind of took all those away, and it just seemed like... It made sense. Yeah, logical step. What we had asked the Lord during foster care and what we had continually said that our our um, answer would be regarding the kids, the calls that we received was always yes. And then we would just pray that the Lord would shut the door if it wasn't right. And that happened. We said yes to another set that the Lord shut the door. And then mm -hmm. since then I have said yes to many. But after time passed, we just realized that more and more that um, God was intending for Levi to stay with us. And so we adopted Levi on Friday, mm -hmm. um, October 13th. Yes. And Fitting. Yep, yeah, <laughs> uh, two years old. And so our family right now is family of four, mm -hmm. the Millers, all four. So that's what our family looks like right now. Specifically, as we're looking at this you know, sermon series about you know, thinking about what resources do we have? What, what is God calling us to do? What is he calling us to give? It's, it's about obedience. And so for us, looking at our family and the way that he's wired us and structured us, we're gonna to continue to be obedient in that realm. So I would say the next step for somebody who wants to become involved in foster care, there's kind of two ways. You can either become a foster family, which is vital and super important. Then, you know, there's obviously, sometimes we want to do something, but we can't. And so the next best thing we would say is to become a certified babysitter if you're able. Also, just like Jay said, being obedient to what God has called us to. Yeah. Foster care is hard, um, but it's also really rewarding. And it's really, um, a great ministry like we've talked about to not only the kids but also the families and so I think that's something that God's taught me throughout the journey. Right. Thank you Millers. That's awesome. So good. Levi looking dapper too. Wasn't he? And Corbin. If y'all don't know the Millers they're sitting right over here. Corbin's right over here. I was about to say Corbin is turned. He's always he's always hyped and I love that about Corbin. Um, and Levi, so good. We have such an incredible staff team, and I'm so thankful for the Millers and all they do for our children. Uh, Marty, you saw earlier, uh, we got Yancey coming up in here this afternoon for a preschool kind of kids' praise time. Bring your kids. Um, come on up here. Nothing better to do this afternoon than that. Um, also, I want to say this before I dive into the message. Uh, we have, today, we introduced to our students, I was able to run up there a little bit, um, we just met our new high school minister. His name's Drew Herndon and his wife, Carolyn, and they're sitting right over here. Would you guys stand? They're sitting right, right there they are. There they are. Welcome them. Yay. We're so glad y'all are here. Um, 
They too have, you know, I have an adopted child as well, and we look forward to getting to know, the, know their family. They're going to be moving during the holidays, so be praying for them, right? You think your holiday is crazy. Uh, they're going to be moving from Memphis, right? Memphis. Uh, how many of you have ever lived uh, kind of in the southeast? That's kind of southeast-ish. How many of you ever lived in the southeast? There's one thing that kind of permeates, um, saturates, covers the entire southeast, and I'm not talking about... Uh, gosh, for me, growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina, is it kind of ACC basketball? In the Southeast, maybe it's, um, what, SEC football, I suppose. Um, but uh, there's, there's something else that really takes over, and it's called kudzu. Anybody? Uh, kudzu. Uh, it just kind of, you know, we, we, we brought this in from Japan, literally, to help with soil erosion and stuff. You can see it along the highways, but kudzu just kind of takes over. It's a, it's a coiling uh, vine that, that just grows rapidly, and it covers everything. If you've ever seen it, um, it's like you can drive along in the southeast, and it's like, kudzu. You know, it's everywhere. And, and it covers trees, and whatever it covers, it has the, the capacity or the, the ability to, to kill. I mean, whatever, whatever it clings to, it can kill it. Whatever the host is, it can just, you know, suffocate it. The sun can't get to it, that kind of thing. Uh, As we walk through this series together, you can see called Owned, we're talking about how the stuff that we own can own us. Prosperity and affluence can become like kudzu, just kind of grows all around us. In fact, you kind of don't even see it sometimes. It's more like maybe, it's more like an environment. Affluence and prosperity becomes uh, the air you breathe. And this is so important to understand because most of us have grown up, if you've grown up in the United States, frankly, uh, if you've grown up in North Dallas, if you live, you know, you come here to this church, you're, you're close enough to have experienced it and to breathe it in all the time. But I would argue it's kind of toxic. It's not unlike secondhand smoke. You don't have to be puffing away to be breathing it in every single day. And, and let's be honest, mass confession, it, it changes the way we see the world. And so today I want to talk about this thing of false prosperity, we're calling it today, owned by false prosperity. That is, we start to see and measure things uh, that we think are prosperous or or, are success or worth so much when in reality it's false. Prosperity can lead us to a false sense of security because we put our our security in those things. Now, let me say this, and and already uh, this needs to be said. Jesus didn't come after people because they were wealthy. You know, living in affluence and such is not a sin. Um, However, Jesus did point out that having much and living in affluence can cause us to have a false sense of what's true and what's valuable in life. He said it's very difficult, as we'll see today, for those of us who are wealthy, who have much, to find ourselves in the kingdom of God. So how do I overcome a pervasive kind of false prosperity and follow Jesus every day? I want you to turn to Mark chapter 10. Would you do that? Mark 10, we're going to look at uh, verses 17 through 31. What happens when uh, the things that that we own come to own us? And we're going to see it here. Now, while you're turning there, if, if this happened in our day, the story might go something like this. He stepped out of his Lamborghini and he took off his $500 sunglasses. His suit is tailored. I suppose his shoes are Italian. His money's invested uh, and his, his uh, schedule's full. In fact, the only thing fuller than his schedule is his wallet. Uh, this guy is rich and you can tell by looking at him. Not only is he rich, but he also has the ability to... To, uh, to continue to go to the gym a few times a week. And uh, energy is his trademark. And death is an eternity away for this guy. He's rich and he's young. And he looks like he just stepped out of a GQ magazine. He's the guy everybody wants to be. He's rich, he's young, and he's powerful. If you don't think so, you can just ask him or people around him. If you have questions, he's got answers. If you have problems, he's got solutions. He knows where he's going and he's going to get there tomorrow. He's got a plan. And he is wealthy, he's young, and he is powerful. He has captured really the three P's of the American dream. Prosperity, posterity, and power. You know him as the rich, young, 
ruler. Thank you. Uh, some of y'all have heard this story. All right? If you haven't, uh, it's going to blow you away. This is one of the most challenging stories in all the Bible. It's there in, in Mark chapter 10. Now, before we, we press on, I've got to say this again. When you talk about wealth and, and such, many of you are sitting here like, well, he's not talking about me. I mean, we have this general sense. Okay, we live in an affluence. And for those of you who, like me, have traveled the world and have been to, to places of great poverty or even in our city, you know that you're blessed, as Justin you know, led us to earlier. We have so much. And, and yet, I could sit here and talk a long time about how wealthy we really are here in America. But here's the truth. I know I could talk for a long time, and, and we'd all be going, well, yeah, but still. Um, I, didn't, you know, like, I didn't choose this. I, wouldn't, I didn't choose to be born in America. And again, it's not sinful that we live in affluence, and many of us have so much. But we, we realize that wealth is, is relative. In fact, there was a study done. It was in 2011. But a Gallup poll study basically came down to most people think they'd be rich if they had twice as much as what they have. Other studies have, have proven this. Uh, and it goes all the way across the board. Like if you're making 30000 a year, if I had 60000 I'd be set. That'd be big time. If, and then it goes all the way. If I, I'm, I'm making $2 million a year, if I had $4 million, then I'd be rich. Because here's the thing. Wealth is relative. We look around. We all know somebody who's got a little bit more than us, right? And so what happens is we, we, we then go into comparison, and we've talked about the fact that comparison is the thief of joy. But it's true that money can capture our hearts. And it's funny, even we, all of us, we, you know, there's a lot of talk in the news today about the one percenters, that, that top one percent in America, and how they're just filthy rich. I mean, we even toss in adjectives like that, as if to say they probably got it, maybe, by some questionable means. And here's what happens. In America, that 1% are people who make $500,000 a year. Or they have $5 million in, in assets. Now, you, you broaden the scope. And you look across the world. And the 1% are those who make $32,000 a year. Now, let me just say it. Not all of us. Most all of us are one percenters. And again, I could go a long time to talk about how wealthy we really are. And my point here is this. We've already kind of talked about it a little bit today and, and led you to the Lord. It should not be guilt. That's not my point today. It should be gratitude. This should lead us not to guilt, but to gratitude, because God's the one who's done this, as Justin noted. He's the one who's given us all that we have. So let's talk about what it is to be owned by a false prosperity. I'm praying that God will do what I can't do. We're going to look at how false prosperity desensitizes us. We're going to see how false prosperity disillusions us. It, it, we can't see the world as we should. And this is what the really point of this story is. And then we're going to see how we can overcome. It can be defeated. Well, how does Christ speak into it? And how can we overcome this, this kudzu, this breathing in of the toxic smoke of affluence that can shrivel up a heart? People have noted that wealthy people often don't smile. We think that if we just have a little bit more, I'll be happy. And actually, it does the opposite often, but it doesn't have to. So let's look at the story. You find it there. Um, I'm going to read through verses 17 through 21. We're going to go all the way through the end of the story. Look at verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him. Look at this. He runs to him. Now, back in the day, here's the thing. Rich people didn't run. You see this in the story of the prodigal son. Father's running. Rich people don't run. Uh, rich people don't, they don't smile a lot. Rich people don't laugh, uh, some people say. And he knelt before him. He starts off in a posture of worship. And by the way, we know more about this story uh, than is here because we see it in Matthew 19 and Luke 18 as well. And he asked him, Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, this, that's his first teaching. This will come back to him. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Now, these are, some of you might know, these are the last, essentially, the last half of the commandments. 
they're the interpersonal ones. They're the horizontal ones. They, none of them have anything to do with the relationship with God. Those are the first ones. And, this, and the man said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And we have no reason to believe this guy's you know, lying. Not only is he rich, young, powerful, he's also uh, an example of moral excellence. I think this guy is very sincere, by the way. I don't want to paint him in the wrong, wrong picture. He's coming, sincerely seeking. How about this? Not only is he all that, he's also humble enough to say, I'm missing something, because that happens, you know. Even with wealthy people, something is missing in my life, and I know it. It was Ted Turner. He said that success is an empty bag, but you don't know it until you got it. And you find yourself wondering, what am I missing? And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I love that. He has compassion for him. It's if to say, I love you, and this is going to hurt. Like you do with your kids, I love you so much. Come over here. Uh, I love you, but you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Look at this. This is Lakhai Halai. It's the call of a rabbi to a disciple. Be my disciple. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That word sorrowful is deeper than that. It's it's, uh, it's the word grieved. It's the same word that that is used when you bury a loved one in the scripture. And he's not being called to bury a loved one. He's being called to bury his possessions, and he cannot do it. He can't do it. So the first thing I want us to see here is that false prosperity desensitizes us. And it desensitizes us to a couple of things. It desensitizes us to our needs, to our own needs. Affluence can make us numb to our real selves. And we have this false sense that I'm okay because I have enough around me. This man wants to know what must I do? Can I buy it? Can I earn it? How do I inherit it? And this doesn't make him, listen, it doesn't make him a villain. It doesn't even make him a bad guy. It makes him, makes him me. Makes him us. What can I do? But because you see, wealth has desensitized us to our real need. And that's the case for him. It's desensitized him to his real poverty, his sin. This man doesn't need, you know, to figure out how can I pay my way into heaven or do work my way there. Uh, this man needs a savior, like all of us. But think about it. No wonder he would respond this way. If the problems that you have are most often fixed by your stuff and your money, then you'd bring that, baptize it into your spirit, into the spiritual dilemma that you face, and you'd say, how can I fix this? I'm fixing everything else I can in my life. This is why you go to places where people are poor and don't have much, and they're much more aware of their brokenness. They're much more open to the Spirit of God moving in their lives. They tend to be much more faithful and, and, and have more faith than those of us who are tied to the material. But here's what's going on here, and it's true in our day. There's a popular theology still today that said if you do well or you do good, you're going to do well. God will bless you if you're a good person. If you're a high moral person, we call it the prosperity gospel, by the way, which is not the gospel. And it says, if you do good, then you're going to do well. And if someone's done well, they must have done good. They, they must be good. In fact, we do this, don't we? We kid ourselves even, but we think when somebody's wealthy, that dude is rich. He must be. He must have made some great decisions. He must be really smart. Maybe not. He may be really stupid. He may have just gotten a lucky break. He may have made a couple of decisions. He caught a wave. He's wealthy. And then we come to believe that ourselves. I'm, I'm successful, check me out. And then we start to measure other people, and we're judgmental. How many of us have done like me? You see a guy on the road, side of the road, and it happens right here, you know, Northwest Highway and around here. Uh, somebody's begging for, for food. They're out homeless. And the thought that often, confessional, goes through my mind, man, that dude made some bad choices. Be where he is. But if I were to put myself in his shoes, born in the same family, Raised in the same circumstance, 
I may be worse off than him. And so we, got, we, 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 we need to see that there's a false sense of, you know, I'm okay because of the stuff I have. That was his problem. This guy lacked not morality, not stuff. He needed to come to understand that, that the solution, here's what happens. The solution to everything is money if you have earning power. And we live our, our lives that way. It's kind of, you know, you've heard it said, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's all you got. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If all you have is, is spending power, everything has a price tag. And you think, I can buy that. I can fix that. And we bring it over into our lives. It desensitizes us to our real needs if we're not careful, if we're not in the Word, if we're not seeing our lives as God sees us. This man needs a Savior. He needs a rescuer, just like you and me. Not only that, it desensitizes us to the needs of others. This is why Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take what you think makes you strong and invulnerable, and I want you to give it to those who are vulnerable and weak. Then you'll be invulnerable. Then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then you'll be truly strong. You see the economy of God? It's flipped. And and the man's going, I cannot. Are you kidding me? It's almost as if Jesus is saying, listen, you want to talk about the commandments? Let's go to the first one. Love God and have no other gods before you, before him. Let's just go to the first one. Because money had become his God. The money was his functional God. His stuff, like a lot of us, was the thing that drove his life. And wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart, your life will run. And that's what's happened to this man. And Jesus says, give it up. He's an addict is what he is. And Jesus says, I want you to go cold turkey. I've had a lot of conversations with people this week to ask the question, do you think Jesus was really telling him to give up all that he had? Because think about it. Give all that you have away and then you'll go to heaven. No, that didn't work either. Keep all the commandments and then you'll go to heaven. No, he's he's trying to help this guy see that he has a greater, deeper problem that he cannot fix. I I don't think Jesus is playing with him, though. It would be interesting. What if the guy did give away all he had and didn't follow Jesus? We'd have a different story. Instead, this ends up being one of the saddest stories of the Bible. And I know coming into this sermon, I realize I'm bringing us to a point today where you have to decide. This is a dangerous message. Because when you face the real Jesus, you're either going to end up saying, I am following you. I'm laying it all down. Or you're going to walk away grieved. Because you can't do it. And those two positions are eternities apart. And I'm praying that you hear the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. False prosperity desensitizes us. But secondly, false prosperity disillusions us. Let's keep pressing on. Look at verse 23. He's not over yet. This is an incredible story. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples standing there with their mouths wide open and their eyes bug-eyed, it doesn't say that, I threw that in there, um, are going, what? what just happened? How, wait a minute. They're amazed, and, and Jesus says to them, children, this is a real tender word, it's used only a couple of times, it's just, hey, hey, boys, boys, hey, kids, kids, children. How difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. That's another way of saying uh, impossible. Notice he doesn't say, this is highly unlikely. Uh, This is improbable. It's rare that this would happen. No, this is impossible for a person with moral excellence and who's all that in your theological thinking For him to get to heaven on his own. That's at the crux of this whole story, gang. Don't miss that. You cannot get to heaven through your good works. You need a rescuer. You need a savior. And then it says in verse uh, 26, And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So here's what I want you to see. Our our second point, false prosperity 
You see, it, it, it delusions us. It, it, it delusions, delusions us to two things. One is to, to what is important to God. This guy thought that all that he had, his wealth, was, was all, all of his life. And Jesus says, no, check out the first commandment. What I want is your heart. And, and he tells him, listen, uh, your money, your stuff has become your God. And I want to ask you the question, what has become your functional God? And you say, well, how, and we've talked about this, if you've been here this month, um, your idol is what the Bible calls it. It's the thing that you, you run to. It's the, it's the thing that you say, if I have that, then I'm going to be a person of worth and value. I have meaning in my life. Or if I can hold on to that and keep that. See, how would you know if money, for instance, uh, has its hold on you? Well, you, you have trouble sharing it. I mean, that's one simple, you don't, you're not a giver. You don't give. Just like this guy, you, you can't release it. Same story. That's how you know. How do you know if anything has a hold on you? Another person, a job, a place, a home, a car? Just have someone ask you for it. Just give it up. That's how you know. It's the whole story of Job, by the way, in the Old Testament. He comes to worship God simply because he's God, not because of anything God's done for him. That's worship. And that's a hard place to get. So only Jesus can come through for you. Only Jesus will not let you down. Only Jesus brings you real life. See, many people have passed the test of adversity even. And how about this? Passed the test of morality and have failed the test of prosperity. Prosperity will take you down more than any of these other things. And so many of us are being convicted by the Spirit even now. But hey, be encouraged. Look up and turn to Him and say, Lord, change my life, change my heart. See, because a false prosperity, it delusions us to what is important to God, but it also delusions us to what is possible for God. Look at what he says. He, again, he doesn't say it's improbable. Who can be saved? Uh, uh, it's impossible for this man to, to work his way to heaven. It's impossible for any of us. And here's what I mean. Here's what happens. When you live in a material world where everything is measured by empirical, scientific, material data, we start to believe that that is the ultimate reality. And we turn to our wallets instead of the word for truth and for correction or solutions. We, we, we think that, you know, uh, uh, a doctor told me that this is the case for me. A psychiatrist told me, a counselor said, you know, this uh, family member is on the way out. Uh, this person will never change. And we listen to counselors, psychiatrists, or we listen to popular opinion instead of the word of God for truth. And we have forgotten that we serve and worship a God of the impossible. You've given up on a family member. Maybe you're going to see him this week. God has not given up on them. Some of us have wayward children. We've just said, well, that's the way it's going to go, evidently. We serve the God of the impossible. Or we say, God will never call me to do this. We serve the God. How do you know? How do you know if you worship the God of the impossible? Your prayers will prove it. Your prayers will prove it. Little baby prayers. Talking about, well, God, I just hope that, you know, I hope this happens. And maybe later on, maybe I'll get a chance to take a nap. God, I just pray that maybe my, my, my day will work. Listen, you, you need to be praying for the impossible to be done. In your life and in the lives of others. Because we serve the God who does the impossible. Turn to, don't turn to popular opinion. Turn to the power of God and His Word and your prayers will point you there. So thirdly and finally, false prosperity is defeated. Watch how it is defeated. Look at verse 28. Peter began to say to him, See, we've left everything and followed you. Now in Matthew, it's a little more explicit. He's like, um, this is so funny, actually. The disciples crack me up sometimes, but we get it. Uh, we're on the other side looking at, and, but he's like, um, we left everything to follow you. Uh, well, what's in it for us? He literally says that in Matthew. And what's interesting, Jesus doesn't go, get over here, Peter. I'm gonna get you. You're so goofy. You, he doesn't rebuke him. This time, he doesn't say, get thee behind me, Satan. You know? um, but he doesn't affirm him either. 
He doesn't say, Peter, you, you are the man. I mean, you, are you kidding me? You're incredible. He doesn't do that. Instead, he says, hey, Peter, and everybody, he says, anyone who does this, anyone who gives up, all of, all of this, and look at what he says. He says, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father, or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters. So you're going to receive other, maybe even more brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. Whoa, wait, wait. That's not the first part. But so that's a blessing as well. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last. You see, Peter is saying, hey, what about, what about me? I've given up a little, little, little something. And, and Jesus says, hey, Peter, listen, whatever you've given up, uh, you're going to get a hundredfold, man. You don't even know. You don't even know. It's why Jesus is the great treasure. He is the one thing this guy doesn't have. What one thing must I do? You need to receive the treasure that is above all other treasures. So when you have it, when you have him, everything else finds its place. Nothing is worth more than him. And it's not even close. It's why we can say to him, I'll lay everything down because the pearl of great price is what I received. You can't put a price tag on that. And that's what Jesus is telling this man. It's what he's saying to us. You can't put a price tag on salvation that comes from God Almighty through Christ who dies on the cross, lives the perfect life for you. This guy wasn't perfect. Nobody's perfect. Christ lives the perfect life on his behalf, on our behalf. He dies on the cross, a death that we should take on ourselves, takes on our shame, our punishment, because we can't measure up. He is now the great exchange. He gives us his life. So how is this defeated? Listen, first by receiving Christ. If you've not received his grace, friend, you are on the pathway to hell. Eternity apart from God. And you're living in it now. So you do it by leaving, he says. We've left everything. Well, the only way to overcome, turn your back on the effects of this life of breathing in the toxins of prosperity is to say it's a constant decision to say, I'm, I'm not I'm not going there. That's not going to be my God. And you might be asking, I hope you are. What do I leave? How, how do I leave? Like, do I move? Like I live in an affluent area or culture or city or you only move. Is that what I do to get? God will tell you. I'm not telling you to leave or to move, but maybe. Well, how, what do I leave behind? How do I listen to God? Be willing. He'll tell you. And it's going to come right to, you, to your God. By leaving, by receiving. This is how it's defeated. By receiving what Christ has done for you. Anyone who would give up is going to receive a hundredfold. Hundredfold. Compared to what you gave up. So you give up and you receive. This again is why the Millers become this great example. You know, you can say, wow, they're giving up a lot, man. I mean, Levi, he's cute, but still, that kind of disrupts your family. That's, wow. That can, that's crazy stuff. You, you talk to them for a moment about the hundredfold blessing that God has brought into your life because of that little dude. Hundredfold. And it's about what matters the most. We, we overcome it by leaving, by receiving, by practicing. This is a daily commitment. He says, deny yourself. See, to thrive in a culture that is churning out the smoke of prosperity, this kudzu that just takes over us, we've got to practice it daily. You've got to commit to deciding, I'm going to be last and not first today. It starts in the home. I'm going to be last, not first. See, we've got to go. We've got to, we've got to give. And I would say that you could be generous. If you're not a giver, gang, you, it's, it's strangling you. It's going to kill you. And one of the ways to overcome is to say, you know what? we got to release. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, release. I'm going to be a giver. And here's the irony here. Wealth is not a destination that you pursue. Wealth is an identity that you possess. True wealth is something that's given to you by Christ, not something you achieve. 
True wealth is his righteousness, the exchange of our sin for his righteousness. That's wealth. That's the pursuit of our lives. It's why we must leave. We must receive what he's given us. And we must practice this on a daily basis. So what does that look like for you? I'm going to close this way. I, I've asked Justin and Holly to come up here. And uh, we talked to Mario uh, last week about what it is to uh, deny yourself and uh, take up your cross and follow Jesus every day. And I want to do the same with, with Holly and Justin. So if you guys come up here. I have known this precious couple here um, to be a couple, of, and you all know this, but sometimes we can fool ourselves. We hear you all on stage, and man, you sound spiritual, and you love Jesus and all that <laughs> stuff. But I know that you really do uh, in real life. So when I first met you, um, it was just outside of Elizabethtown, Elizabeth mm -hmm. Kentucky. We were in Louisville, I think, and um, had come to see and visit you guys first time we met you all. And we asked you to come here and, uh, and to say, okay, so family recently kind of moved nearby. You're with your family. They're in a great church there. And uh, we want you all to come here. And none of us thought that you would really, you know, like really do it. But we were like, no, we want you all to come here. <laughs> and you did. Yeah. And you gave up, I mean, family, mm -hmm. incredible kind of neighborhood, church, the whole deal. And you said, yeah. And, and I've come to find out or realize that's the way that you live your life. How did you come to that? And what talk to us about yeah. that? Holly and I both from the beginning of our marriage, and I think because we had parents who modeled that for us, who were always willing to do whatever God called them to do, we've always just said we want to live our lives open to whatever God wants to do in our life. We, we want to be obedient no matter the cost. And yeah, so we, we lived in Kentucky, and uh, that's where all of our family is. We were in a great church, and Holly's mom was actually the senior pastor's uh, assistant, and her grandparents were in the church. My parents were just an hour down the road. And so when Park Cities contacted us, at, at first it's like, no, God, we don't want to leave this place that we love so much in this comfortable place mm. where we grew up. Uh, but it was actually Jim right here, Herrera, who was on the, the blame, committee. Yeah. Blame him. Yeah, blame Jim. Good. But he's, he said to us, uh, go, Jim. he said to us on the, on the phone one day, he said, um, you know, I get that, but is there any place in Scripture really that God ever tells people, you just be comfortable uh, right where you are? Instead, the opposite is true. He's all, God's always calling us out of our comfort to be obedient, to do whatever uh, whatever it takes to to follow him. So I guess for, for me, I... Uh, I never wanted to be like uh, Moses. When God called Moses, basically, in a sense, Moses said, here am I, Lord, send Aaron. <laughs> uh, because he, he said, I can't do it. I'm not equipped to do it. You, use my brother instead or whatever. Yep. Um, I don't want to stand before God one day and God say, I want to do something great in your life. And he won't be mad at me because of his grace if I didn't follow him. But I don't want to miss out on his blessing and just the, the reward of mm -hmm. laying our lives down. Uh, to follow Jesus, because he gave his life for us. We sang it earlier. Jesus yep. paid it all all to him. Right. Uh, we, man, uh, and that's thinking, our lives. I know yeah. where this uh, sermon was heading today, uh, singing that. Mm. I was going, man, that's a dangerous song. Yeah, and right. do I, can I really sing that? Yeah. I think, honestly, I don't know any of us really sing that, yeah. honestly, right? Yeah. But we sing aspirational songs. Yes, I want that to be true of me. He gave it all for me. That's I want right. to give my life to him. Yeah. So um, in recent days, uh, we've been talking and praying together yeah. a lot, and uh, the Lord's uh, calling you to to give up more and more. Yeah, that's right. So um, the danger, I guess, of living your life open uh, to God's call is you, you don't just all of a sudden shut that off and say, well, I did that once or I did that yeah. a few times in my life. I'm, I'm never going to follow you again, Lord. And so we're open always to whatever God wants to do in our lives, no matter the cost. And so, uh, yeah, a few months ago now, um, Former teaching pastor here, Sam Holm, uh, reached out to Holly I and I. Don't even remember. Him. Actually, reached out to you. <laughs> he he actually called you first before he, he called me. He called me and he said, uh, "Hey Jeff, we're looking for a worship pastor, and uh, do I have your permission to talk to uh, Justin? Because I'm I'm really wanting to do what's best." And I think he got teary out on the phone. No kidding. Y'all know Sam. He's like, "I want I want what's best for Park City." And I said, get thee behind me, Satan. That is when I said that. I said that. Uh, and I hung up on him. He called back. And um, No, I, I said, you know, I don't know how that is in your business, your work. But for us, I mean, for all of us, it's, you know, I trust Christ in all of this. I'm a kingdom man. And, uh, and the Lord, it's his church. And I said, yeah, you can talk to him. Uh, I know he loves it here. We love serving together. So we'll just, you know. Yeah. And so in, initially, whenever Sam called me and told asked Holly and I to pray uh, about 
coming up there to McKinney, I, I know initially we both said we don't think that that's what God uh, would have for our family. Um, our kids are so important to us. We love our kids, and uh, they're they're great right where they are. They, they're sitting right down there. They love uh, their, their school and all their friends, and uh, we love this church so much, um, mostly, well, many reasons. We love so many people here, so many good friends. But I've never had a pastor, and I mean this with all of my heart, I've never had a pastor like Jeff. If if the Bible from beginning to end is all about Jesus, and it is, by the way, if it's all pointing to him, there's nobody better that I've ever seen that we've ever served under to remind us constantly every moment um, that we talk to you, that we're with you, and every time you preach, every time you pour into our lives um, about the gospel and how much... uh, And behind Jeff, is mm. this treasure that a lot of you don't know, and it's Stacy. Yeah. And in my life, Stacy has been a mentor. <laughs> and she's helped me even raising our kids and just figuring out how to be a pastor's wife in my role. And so we're just so grateful yeah. for you all. And, and so we began to pray, and w- we didn't feel like God was leading us, but as we've prayed over these past couple months and really prayed with you, and as you have... Um, just giving us your wisdom and just really sought to be our pastor, yes, but also just my friend, mm-hmm. um, my mentor. Um, we began to realize that God is calling us uh, to McKinney. And so um, it's hard because we love this church. It's hard to move our kids. Um, we're going to have to move to McKinney, even though it's close. We're going to uh, move up the road a little bit. And it's hard to leave such a great church and such a great godly man. Um, but again, uh, because we know with all of our hearts that God is leading us, uh, we're not going to say no ever. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're certainly seeking to do that the rest of our lives. Yeah. Uh, to say, God, whatever you want to do in us, we're yours. We belong to you. He owns us. Yes. Um, right. He bought us at the cross. So uh, we're going to, you know, we've cried already. We've been through tears and such. So it's hard not to even in front of you here. But um, I want to say this before we close this time. We're going to sing a song out. But uh, Holly, you, um, you've been a big part of this whole story, not only... Uh, you know, gosh, just leading so powerfully all every week and, and such. But we know of your love for Justin and support of him and his role as being on staff. But, you know, I'm guessing there's a lot of moms out here, parents, um, who really have determined God would never call me to do something mm-hmm. uncomfortable. Not really. He would not call me to leave my neighborhood. He'll never call me to leave this house that I love. He'll never, he would never do that. How, how have you walked through? Don't say never. Uh-huh. Especially if you're seeking his will, then you live like this instead yeah. of like this. And it's very hard. Like we're not going to sit up here and say, oh, this is easy. Mm-hmm. This is really hard. And it's hard for our kids. And, you know, you can worry. That's kind of like my job. I take on the kids mm-hmm. and worry about them, worry about their school and making friends. And even for myself, starting over over again and I could like sit in that but then God tells us cast those off to me give them to me and I promise you he will be faithful every time there's not been one time that he has not been faithful to provide for our needs and then give us so much more amen amen so um here's what we're gonna do gang we're gonna we're gonna close here today we're gonna pray and we're gonna sing we're gonna sing a song that is really designed to guide us to him and commit ourselves to him. Um, And they're going to be here. So we're not, I'm not going to, we're not going to get all, all weepy right now. (laughs) We'll do that later. I've already done that. We'll do that more. But um, we love these two so much and I love them with all my heart. And uh, I'm believing and trusting that the Lord has great plans for us. Just as you guys are are leaving in really a few weeks. I'll talk about that. Um, you know, the Herndons are coming. I mean, yeah. God calls us out and he, and he leads. And when you're open to him, we're always raising up people and sending them out. I've said it, the, to live the missional life means you're always saying goodbye because you're always raising up people and sending them or you're going yourself mm-hmm. and you're willing to give up mothers and fathers and brothers and houses and all, all that Jesus would say and to go wherever he's calling you. That's the challenge for you today. What is he calling you to do? You need to come before him and ask that question. And he may have you live and be, and I hope that's the case, uh, right where you are for the rest of your life, unless he's calling you to do something else. Uh, Maybe a job. Maybe maybe just to love some crazy uncle who's coming to your house this week. (laughs) It might be that. Um, Just to love, love, love. So... We're going to, um, over the next few weeks, they're going to be with us. They're going to be here through the 17th, and we'll have a, a deal out 
uh, in the commons uh, where we'll just come by and love y'all and hug you guys. But thank you. They're going to be here for, uh, for the next few weeks with us, which is a great thing into the Christmas holidays. We got plans already. We're making plans towards Christmas Eve. It's going to be awesome. Um, you'll hear more about that as the days come. But I'm believing too, gang. Listen, don't we're sad because we love these two. We're friends for life. But uh, God has big plans for us here. Amen? Amen. He has plans for us. And he has someone that he's going to call to help and to serve and lead us here. And take us to the next season Mm. in the life of our church. I trust that. He's always done that. He did it with you guys here. And we'll never sing the same in this room because of y'all. I praise God for you. We love you so much. We're going to pray. And then we're going to sing our way out of here. Okay? So let's pray together. Uh, I'm going to pray over them, and then we'll, we'll lean into uh, our own prayers together. God, we thank you so much for the Hornsby's. We praise you for their lives. We thank you, God, that you have uh, gifted uh, us with them for a season, a few years here. And we will never be the same. And we thank you that they are such an example of just trusting you and following you. And we know, too, God, that you uh, have us in your hands, and you have plans for us in the days to come. And so... Uh, Lord, as we, as we send them off, we praise you. Uh, we thank you for their family. But Lord, as we close our time together, we, we hold our hands out open, our hearts open to you, and we give you our lives, knowing that the treasure of Jesus is worth more than anything. And following you and what you would call us to do is better than anything in the world. And so we give you our lives anew. Uh, all that we are, we give to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.